All right. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, ANSPIG's um, July uh, webinar, uh, which is entitled Biomass Crops for Biochar and Rehabilitating Degraded Land Toward Productive Land for Food. We have three uh, great uh, speakers today, which is Fabiano Chemines from, uh, he's a re re senior research scientist, scientist at Forest Science, uh, New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. Uh, Charles Coves, uh, who is uh, from the Indust Australian Industrial uh, Hemp Alliance. And then Peter Brown, uh, who is from Miscanthus, New Zealand. So um, without uh, further ado, uh, we are going to, this webinar, by the way, will run for an hour and a half. So uh, each presenter will present for approximately 20 minutes. And then at the end, uh, we'll go into a Q&A. And, &A, and uh, that will be uh, led by uh, Craig Bagnall, who's a, a senior environmental engineer at uh, the CETA Group and a foundational member of, of ANSBIG, and uh, he initiated this webinar. So um, first of all, I'm gonna stop uh, sharing the screen. Um, also to let you know, uh, if you would like to ask any questions, just put them in the uh, Q&A panel that's, a, that's available. And then um, uh, Sam, our general manager, will um, uh, go through those at the end. So, um, I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen now and uh, I'll just introduce our first uh, speaker, which is Fabiano uh, Um So Fabiano, if you want to share your slides and, and come up on the screen. Um, Fabiano uh, joined the New South Wales government in 2000 and his projects over the years have focused on the development and implementation of novel methods for more accurately uh, estimate carbon in forest uh, systems and in wood products, including the dynamics of decomposition of wood and paper products in landfill. This work and other projects have informed the development of national and international greenhouse inventories and have been accurately considered in the formulation of carbon policy. Fabiano was one of the lead authors of the IPCC 2013 Revised Supplementary Methods and Good Practice Guidance Arising from the Kyoto Protocol, Harvested Wood Products Chapter. More recently, Fabiano's work has focused on biomass assessments and in its potential for use as bioenergy and other applications. So welcome, Fabiano, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Don. Um, thank you, Don and Craig, for the invitation. I, I, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, and if I don't hear otherwise, I'll keep going. But um, uh, look, at, yeah, it's, um, it's great to talk to you today and welcome to those online. Um, as Don mentioned, I'm with uh, DPI Forestry, um, the Forest Science Unit. And uh, today we'll be talking about um, some work we've been doing around the development of biomass crops in New South Wales. Um, it's a network of research trials that we have developed as part of a project that's funded by um, the New South Wales Climate Change Fund. It's a broader project that includes other elements, um, all geared towards understanding and how we can best utilize biomass in New South Wales for a number of applications. Just by way of a quick outline, um, as, as I mentioned, um, the main focus is around our biomass crop trial work. And I also I will also spend a bit of time talking about um, some specific opportunities that we see as a result of this work, particularly around um, you know development of those crops in marginal farmland, uh, degraded mining land, <clears throat> opportunities opportunities around nutrient mining, particularly in the context of um, um, abattoir and treatment of wastewater, and final considerations to finish it off. Just to start with a broader context and for you know people to have a, a broader understanding about biomass, um, I guess uh, most people will, will realize this, but in Australia, we've got a range of different types of feedstocks that may be considered as biomass uh, resource. 
Um, forestry is one of the key industries that generates a lot of the biomass, both uh, during forest harvest operations, but also when you process the timber at various types of wood processing industries. The agriculture industry is another major um, uh, provider of uh, biomass, and particularly in, in terms of uh, straw from cropping applications, but also livestock and manure that's generated there. And also other industries such as horticulture and winery and, um, and the end of life waste uh, in terms of uh, organic waste to go to landfills. If we focus more specifically on New South Wales and how much biomass is generated in the form of residues here, um, I guess we've we've been working um, a fair bit on this topic for the last few years, and uh, we've been able to populate a, a national tool called the Australian Biomass for Bio well, uh, via a project called the Australian Biomass for Bioenergy Assessment, where we've populated a national map with special with spatial uh, information around availability of biomass from different industries. And on this table here on your screen, you can see uh, a summary table where we've got um, estimate, estimates of residues from uh, key industries in New South Wales. Um, those figures are all in dry tons. And uh, you can see that, you know, conservatively, we estimate that uh, in excess of 22 million tons of uh, <clears throat> residues are generated as a result of those activities. And if you want a bit more information around how those figures are derived and a bit more of a breakdown, you can go to the uh, link on your screen the website. Some key considerations around the biomass. Um, as you understand, New South Wales is quite a large state and a lot of the biomass is quite geographically dispersed, which, prevents ch uh, which presents challenges in terms of um, using that effectively and the economics of moving that. Um, also, another characteristic to understand is that, you know, biomass can vary significantly in terms of their physical properties particularly the moisture content being one of the key elements there driving potential applications. Um, just as an example, if you have drier residues, um, such as forestry um, residues, then that lends itself more to you know, combustion type applications, whereas we're talking about wetter residues, such as um, livestock, manure, and liquid waste, then that, that lends itself more to anaerobic digestion applications. Um, but either way, recently we have seen a large, um, a sharp increase in demand for biomass in New South Wales. Um, and one example is um, a power station in the Hunter Valley called uh, Red Bank, which is now called Verdant Earth, which um, has, is transitioning from 100% coal generation to 100% biomass, which will, will mean a demand of um, close to a million tons of biomass a year, which is significant. So in order to cope with that, predicted increase in demand, and also with um, some of those challenges associated with using existing biomass, uh, we decided to understand what is the potential for um, woody energy crops or woody biomass crops for New South Wales. Um, and I guess one of the key elements there is understanding what are the co-benefits associated with those crops. Um, obviously, we do have uh, the, main, um, uh, the main driver there in terms of uh, generating biomass, but also we've got a number of core benefits in terms of uh, carbon sequestration, the possibility to you know, um, earn carbon credits from your plantings, and also a number of other uh, potential benefits, including um, income diversification for landholders, which is particularly important during drought times, um, and also more land-specific elements such as um, provision of shelter, provision of habitat, opportunities to rehabilitate the land from a mining perspective, for instance, and also a bunch of other things to do with soil health and soil quality. So we've set up this work in collaboration with uh, the CSIRO, particularly with um, David Bush from the Australian Tree Seed Centre. Um, as, a, as a target, we're talking about short, very short rotation crops, you know, two to four year rotation times and uh, native woody crops, so only native species. Only looking at the graded and marginal land as targets for this type of planting, particularly to avoid any um, perceptions there around uh, competition with food in terms of um, prime agricultural land. And some of the key things we want to understand from this work is uh, you know, what productivity we can expect from different crops um, across different areas of the state. Uh, so that we can provide landholders with confidence or some confidence around, you know, which species they um, uh, would get a better biomass um, productivity, uh, depending on the, on the region they're planting. Also understanding carbon sequestration, particularly um, for the purposes of uh, potential death for claiming carbon credits under the Climate Solutions Fund. 
and importantly, copper seam potential, you know, given that um, that's going to have pre, um, important implications from a cost seam perspective. Uh, if you're talking about a system where you can um, continuously coppice it without having to replant every two or four years. A quick uh, slide here showing where our current biomass crop trials are located. Um, quite a wide range of um, uh, geographical locations there, which is represented also in terms of site characteristics. Um, you know, in terms of rainfall, for instance, rainfall patterns go from low and uniform in some areas to high and some are dominant in other areas. Uh, temperatures vary quite significantly. You know, we've got a your more cool climates, such as the orange region, and also warmer areas, such as Trangi. Um, and also in terms of soil types, you know, we've got a range of different soil types included here, including um, sandy, sandy soils and clay loam soils. In terms of uh, what, um, you know, what were the drivers behind selection of the, of the species? Um, so obviously potential for rapid early growth. There's no point in working with species if they're not going to you know, produce a reasonable, um, a reasonable amount of biomass within a relatively short period of time. Um, also, you know, working species that are known to be quite resistant to things like drought and frost. Um, as I mentioned previously, ability to cop ability to coppice is strongly preferred, so that uh, you know we can have a system that's more economically viable. Um, some tr some track record of performance is preferred, so that we can guide you know a little bit our selection there, and also Australian native species because of um, the range of core benefits that uh, come with that in terms of um, biodiversity and etc. And I'm not sure how many of you may be familiar with the different um, species names from native trees in Australia, but here I just have a few um, uh, of the main species that we are using in our crop trial sites. Um, and there's uh, something for everyone here. There's a, a couple of um, acacia species, acacia saligina, acacia diobata. There's one casuarina species, um, Calitris glauca. And then the majority of them being eucalyptus species. Um, some of the more traditional forestry species, such as um, Eucalyptus camadolensis, which is river red gum, or Eucalyptus clavicalix, which is sugar gum. And then uh, there's also a range of uh, mallee type species uh, included in the mix. And for those of you who are not familiar with mallees, they are multi-stemmed, reasonably short trees, which you now have an ability to coppice after many, many um, rotation periods. Um, some of the key Species of interest here as well. There are some novel species which have never been trialed before, particularly Eucalyptus castrensis, which is um, in the picture you can see on the screen. Um, that's also known as singleton mallee, so it's endemic to the Hunter Valley. Uh, and also we've got Eucalyptus pumula, uh, which is also endemic to the Hunter Valley, the Pocobon region. And um, we decided to include them in the trial because it's relatively, relatively unusual to have mallee species which grow in the higher rainfall areas compared to the very dry areas where they, they prevail. And we've got a bunch of filly species as well to, in cases where we've got plots that needed to be completed with, um, a, 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 I guess, a, a smaller number of trees. It also provides us an opportunity to widen the selection as well. So a few pictures here of um, how do some of those trees are performing. They're on your first, on your left-hand side, Eucalyptus camadolensis river red gum. After one year at Tamworth, you can see a pretty vigorous growth. Um, Eucalyptus cladocalyx or sugar gum, one year at a scone as well, again, doing extremely well there. Um, an example from acacia species, acacia saligna, that's uh, one year at Yanko, very sandy soil there. We also thought to include one of the um, mallee species, Eucalyptus inferra, which um, I guess this is one, this, this picture is not from one of our current trials, it's from um, um, a private plantation in the casino region of New South Wales, but just to show how well those, those trees can do even after just one year of uh, or following planting. In terms of the design, just to, to, to explain how we've, we've designed this, this experiment, we've got about typically about eight replications across you know, each of those sites. Each replication has um, plots of uh, all individual species that are contained in the, in the study. And then each one of those individual plots has 100 trees of the same species. So typically we have you know, between 700 and 800 trees of uh, the one species distributed across the, the same trial. And also we've got a range of buffer trees that are included in the perimeter of the trial. Um, for those of you who are particularly interested in finding out more about the different trials and the, and the different designs, um, we've got a bunch of fact sheets that we produced and uh, they're all available in the 
in the link that's provided in this in this in this uh, slide. Uh, this is just to show some of the conditions that we we're faced with for our, for our initial trials. Um, we had to start the first trials um, in the middle of the drought, which wasn't ideal. Uh, and here you can see how you know the conditions that were in place uh, immediately before and after trial establishment. And the orange line is long-term monthly mean. And you can see when those trees were planted at Yenko and at Orange around the um, spring in both those years in you know 2019 the rainfall was you know, much, much lower than the average rainfall. And that was a direct result of that um, extreme drought that we were faced with. And then after a period of time, it was a return to better conditions. You know. so, but um, it was particularly challenging around the time of planting. All the trials were planted within a year from each other. So Yanko and Orange were planted first, and then all the other sites followed. And the last one was planted uh, roughly you know, about one, one year after the first ones were planted. Um, just some generic issues and commentary for those who are interested in this type of um, potential for in terms of biomass crops. Um, the quality of the seedling can be an issue, and you know, so it's important to work with the nursery to ensure that the seedling, seedlings are of uh, good enough quality. Um, early survival was poor, as I mentioned before, due to those climatic challenges, particularly to do with, um, with the drought. And then, ironically, you know, the conditions were extremely wet a year after. So those things both presented challenges. Um, for instance, in the orange side, we've, we had issues with waterlogging, frost, weeds, herbicide drift. So it, has, it was particularly impacted by a number of those very challenging situations. And Yanko had also similar situations there in terms of weed and herbicide issues. And for the, for the other sites that were established after 2019, Soil moisture was was far better, which which resulted in, in much better conditions from a planting perspective. Um, but also, you know, in terms of uh, following the drought, there was a quite a significant weed seed bank that was established in the soil, which um, then basically exploded following the the, the wet that we had afterwards. So, quite a few issues in terms of uh, managing that. I just see a few examples here of the the weeds from some of the sites that we had to deal with. Uh, so as I said, not not uh, really easy to to deal with. In terms of the Mac and uh, some early results um, from our site in collaboration with Mac Energy up at the Hunter Valley in Musselbrook. Uh, this is just a chart showing the survival and growth following after six months of planting. And I guess the standout here would be the Camarillensis species, uh, River Red Gum, which um, at the top now at that time the tallest trees and uh, the highest rate of survival as well. Um, Acacia de Obata also had quite significant you know, growth, but uh, mortality was um, was a bit of an issue there. And all the other species, very similar growth and very similar, very similar uh, survival rates as well. So just in terms of some initial lessons there, you know, some seasons, some seasons may be a no-go for establishment. So obviously you would avoid the middle of a, a major drought. Um, Trials with mixed species present a challenge for weed control because, you know, we've got, if you think about our setup, we've got a range of trees, you know, mallees, they are particularly, they're slower growing than traditional forestry species, which then means that uh, weed control has to be, you know, adapted to the different species as well, which presents challenges for, for the, this type of trial. Mallees are still slow to establish on higher rainfall sites. Weeds are not, so there between weeds and mallees, which, which require more weed control. And one of the things that we found is that uh, perhaps, you know, in terms of weed control, one of the options may be to, instead of uh, trying to, to deal with uh, the weed with herbicides, et cetera, um, establishment of grass and interrows may be an option, because then the, in that way we can keep down the broadleaf weeds, but also provide a greater opportunity there after the trees are well established. So the next steps in terms of this work, uh, we're going to be weighing um, biomass in plots. So we're going to be basically harvesting full plots and then weighing that biomass to understand what productivity is. Uh, do some biomass fractionation work and to understand carbon and you know where that carbon is going to the different parts of the trees, and also to understand over a long period of time or after we harvest those trees, what is the likely what is the the performance of the coppice that that's generated. Just very quickly, I'm conscious of the time, just quickly touch upon some of the opportunities that we see for this work. The first obvious one is to do with marginal farmland. We understand that in our know, New South Wales, there are large areas of uh, 
marginal land that may be suitable for this purpose. You know, there are estimates that are close to 20 million hectares may be available for that purpose. Um, really targeting non-productive areas, so no competition with food. And one of the, the advantages there is providing uh, some income diversification for landholders, which is particularly important, in, you know, as I mentioned, in times of drought. Uh, one of the key advantages there is that because we're dealing with short rotation trees, there's no long-term commitment. So you don't have to, you know, work as, as a traditional forestry crop, crop where you have to wait 25, you know, 30 years before you get a, a good solo crop. Here we're talking about just committing your land for short periods of time for, for a pretty simple um, planting strategy. Um, trees, you know, if you target hardy trees, low maintenance and coppicing species, that helps with economics. Um, and obviously dealing as well, highlighting what the core benefits might be, may well bring uh, some of those projects over the line in terms of, um, you know, attracting enough landholders. That opportunity there for mining regions, particularly, you know, in terms of uh, the opportunity to uh, rehabilitate land, but at the same time get a productive outcome. Um, so, you know, having trees in, the back, trees in the landscape help to improve soil health. And, you know, obviously if you're talking about native trees, um, improving biodiversity outcomes, getting that carbon sequestration as well. And in the case of, um, you know, uh, regions where they may be interested in providing in, in um displacing some of the coal with biomass in terms of electricity generation, then um, you know, those trees may also supply some of the biomass and at the same time assisting with that transition from fossil fuels. One particularly niche application, but which can also be quite interesting, is in relation to abattoirs, um, which quite often need to manage the um, wastewater, which is, you know, quite nutrient rich. And in order to, to manage that, they need to, you know, um, distribute that across a large area of land. Um, and they need to deal with that high nutrient concentration, and, and that provides an ideal scenario there in terms of uh, using trees for for doing that uh, nutrient mining, if you like, um, and at the same time supplying biomass for energy on site. You know, abattoirs are very energy intensive, um, and also potential opportunities there, particularly if you're talking about you know accessing the trees from from well, the, sorry, the leaves from those trees, which would be particularly nutrient rich, and uh, some of the opportunities there around composting that. Um, and then, you know, achieving multiple benefits there in, in terms of nutrient management, but also biomass supply and carbon sequestration. So just my last slide, just to, as a quick summary there, some considerations. Um, one of the things to really be aware of and to keep in mind is that weed management, it's a particularly important issue to deal with and to be quite uh, prepared for. Um, I've talked a lot about woody species, but obviously there are quite a few opportunities there for non-woody species as well if you're particularly interested in energy generation, and I know Peter is going to be talking about miscanthus, but you know, things like miscanthus or banner grass may, may be of interest. Um, also understanding a bit about harvest systems and what may be fit for, for, for purpose, you know, what uh, mallee trees are quite different to harvest and to manage uh, compared to traditional forestry species, so it's important to have an understanding of that. Um, but also understanding the co-benefits, because you know, that will be essential in, in our view to bring a project over the line. I don't think any of those um, landholders will be too keen on being engaged if the only benefit is uh, the biomass in the end. I think you know being the ability to demonstrate those you know environmental uh, benefits as well as the carbon sequestration that they may, may be able to claim, um, I think are important in terms of talking to landholders. And also to understand that uh, biomass may be used for so many different things, obviously including biochar and bioenergy and in the future potentially for you know green chemicals or whatever it may be but i think it's um it's pretty clear that uh, the demand for biomass is only going to increase over time and i think it's important to understand as we're trying to do here you know what what may be growing where and how much to expect from those trees um so thank you all for listening and if you like more information uh, please um, feel free to get in touch with me or you can go to our website as well where there's much more information around this whole project so thank you very much Okay. okay, thank you very much, uh, Fabiano. Uh, if you just, uh, yeah, um, if you could just remove yourself from the, the stream now, Fabiano, and we'll come to you at the end for questions. So if you've got any questions for Fabiano, please uh, put them in the Q&A. And uh, moving to our next uh, speaker now is Charles Coves. Uh, now, he's the Secretary of the Australian Industrial Hemp Alliance, and as well as being uh, AIAH's Secretary, 
Charles chairs the AIAH subcommittees on fibre and herd and marketing. Charles graduated from the University of Melbourne uh, with a Bachelor of Law with honours uh, in 1973 and gained his Master of Law from Monash University in 1980. Uh, Charles has been heavily involved in, ass in assisting TCI, uh, Textile and Composite Industries, achieve its global vision and goals. Uh, Charles has been TCI's CEO, as well as its International Marketing Director. So, um, Charles, I will hand it over to you and, um, uh, yeah, please enjoy. Thank you, Don, for the introduction, for the opportunity to be here. Hello, everybody. I want to share some information on hemp, a picture on hemp in the next few minutes. And there are two reasons why I'm involved in hemp. And that is because I got sucked into it like a vortex back in 2012. And it is, it is the view, it is the view of the hemp industry. And certainly my view that hemp is a global game changing opportunity, very relevant to the biochar industry, hugely relevant to Australia's soil, agricultural opportunities and rejuvenating regions. It is my view, it is the view of our industry that helping family farms succeed is a better strategy for the planet than having agriculture entirely corporatized <clears throat> and everybody living in the city. So that's why I got involved in hemp and then I was I was asked by TCI to help them commercialize and then the founder died six years ago and I got involved with the Industrial Hemp Alliance and I'm now the secretary. So what I'm talking about is decortication of industrial hemp without reading the holy grail of profitability and sustainability. And Fabiano talked about this whole question. So biochar is good, but just growing for biochar is not. So this is this presentation is designed to raise your awareness around this possibility or the, the possibilities around hemp. And Sam is going to drive my slides through this process. So Sam, yeah. next slide, please. Hi. Charles, we're just getting some feedback. Um, so if you could, you, if you could just keep your head tilted towards the microphone, um, that would that would be great. Yeah. My head tilted. I know you're very. Oh. Okay, so I know you're very passionate. And you like moving your head. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. Okay. So, Sam, the next slide, please. So, industrial hemp is a global game changing agribusiness opportunity that improves the environment, sequesters carbon efficiently, enables profitable and sustainable farming, and reduces the global usage of synthetic chemicals and damaging products. Next. This presentation is made to honor Adrian Clark, the founder of TCI, which is Textile and Composite Industries, and the inventor of the world's best decorticator. A decorticator that does not need retting of hemp, and I'm gonna explain what retting is in a moment. He died on the 15th of October. He dedicated the last part of his life to solving the major problem of the hemp industry, how to decorticate without retting. And this problem, is the reason why hemp globally is still a cottage industry compared, uh, contrasted to a mainstream industry. Next. The Australian Industrial Hemp Alliance is a not-for-profit that was registered in 2015. Our purpose is to represent people and organisations involved in industrial hemp and associated products and suppliers to the hemp industry at a national level. There are state industrial hemp associations. We are the peak national body for industrial hemp. And we have four key areas of interest, food, fiber, herd, and medicinal. The food comes from the seed. And obviously some of you know that, and I just have to make the assumption that it, the reminder is useful. Food comes from the seed, the fiber and the herd come from the stalk and medicinal comes from the flowers and the buds through an extraction system. Next. 
The most expensive step in using hemp is the process of separating the stalk into its component parts of fiber and herd. This is called decortication. TCI is driven by its philosophy of helping farmers become more profitable, independent, environmentally green and sustainable. And we've developed a decortication machine over the past 27 years that eliminates these expensive processing costs. Next. For the past 8,000 years, and that's how long we've been using hemp, the only way to separate the hemp plant into its component parts was to commence with retting the harvested stalk. It's a rot Retting is a rotting process designed to break down the molecular bonds within the plant via biological action. Retting can be achieved in a number of ways. Soaking in hot water, the Chinese do it in huge million litre swimming pools leaving harvested stalks in the field for three to six weeks, sometimes three months, steaming the stalks or a combination. Retting is expensive, labour intensive, time consuming and entirely inappropriate for our Australian climate. It also damages the plant. Next. There are opportunities in hemp for farmers investors, designers of machinery, industrial products and systems, manufacturers of textiles and composites. That's why we're called textile and composite industries, food and cosmetics manufacturers, retailers, agricultural machinery suppliers, agricultural support services. And if those opportunities are capitalized on, then the regions around Australia will have a magnificent flurry of economic activity and people won't want to leave the regions for the cities. Next. I've crafted a mantra, HP by four. This is not HP source, but H and P being the first and fourth letters of the word. Healthy products lead to healthy people, lead to a healthy planet and healthy profits. This is the promise of industrial hemp. Now, industrial hemp is cannabis. Marijuana is cannabis. Medicinal cannabis is cannabis. Industrial hemp is cannabis that has less than 1% of THC, one of the cannabinoids, tetrahydrocannabinol. That's the only cannabinoid that gets you high and makes marijuana what it does. Next. There's one plant, 10 categories of products. Now, Don, I can't see you. When you put your note up there, I can't see my screen. <clears throat> Thank you. Just contemplate this. One plant has these 10. If you can just, I know of no other broad acre crop that can provide food, clothing, shelter, medicine, fuel from ethanol, Fertilizer, soil rejuvenation, composite materials replacing fiberglass and carbon fiber, body care products, rope, baling twine, string and weed matting, and packaging products, paper and cardboard. No other plant has got the possibility. And from one plant, next slide, please. Here's a picture of these 10 products. No other broad acre crop has got anything like this versatility. And each of these 10 categories you can make thousands of products from it. Next. So the profitability of hemp growing. This is key indicative numbers for one hectare. The costs of growing, $1,700 to $2,000. You need 50 kilograms per hectare. Now, make the distinction here between a fiber crop, which is closely planted, and a seed crop, which is less densely planted. So you only need 25 kilograms per hectare for a seed crop. That's if you want to, if you're only producing for seed or if you want to bulk up your seed. The harvesting and processing costs are $4,000 per hectare and the products for sale at the farm gate. You get three tons of fiber worth $2,500 a ton. The herd, seven tons per hectare. That's $7,000 and seed minimal value, minimal one ton at three thousand dollars per ton that is a total value seems ridiculous of seventeen thousand five hundred dollars per hectare once you have decorticated you've got those decortication costs are covered in your harvesting processing costs and you're looking at well over five thousand dollars profit per hectare
you do need water. We're not going to go into it. We can do the question and answer of other stuff. But this is why TCI got in this business, because hemp can be an incredibly profitable crop. And here's my promise to you. You cannot grow too much hemp because there are thousands of different products. You don't oversupply a market because if there is an oversupply, you produce another product. Next slide, please. There's the cross section of the hemp stalk. What we need to do to capitalize on the stalk, you can't use the stalk, you can use the whole stalk for biochar, but that's a different, that, that opportunity use we can talk about in Q&A, but you can see the herd is the center part of the plant, roughly 70% by weight, and the fiber on the outside is 30% by weight. Next slide. Each of those elements has different usages. There's a picture of ideal fiber crops, three to four meters tall in 90 to 100 days from seed and get three tons of fiber, seven tons of her dry weight and in many occasions, 20 tons of biomass per hectare in 100 to 100, and between 90 and 120 days. It requires much less water than cotton in the realms of two to three megaliters per hectare if the ground is not wet enough, two to three megs per hectare, and the biomass production is extraordinary, four tons per hectare of root matter. And that root matter breaks down very quickly, and so that rejuvenates the soil. So just picture bamboo if you want to think about a fibre crop. A seed crop is no higher than two metres, three me two metres, two and a half metres, and is more bushy. A fibre crop where you want to access the fibre in the herd looks like this. Next slide, please. Here's another picture of crops in different formats, different ways they've been planted, the seed pods at the top. Next. There's another picture of a, a similar crop, from, I think from the same farmer. Next. The ideal thickness of hemp stalks for fiber and herd production is, is, is the thickness between the thickness of a man's thumb and little finger. Next. <clears throat> the machine that we've developed, we make it in Geelong for global markets. This is the D8 decorticator. Decorticator, strange word, comes from taking the fiber off the core. Next, it, this is fully Internet of Things capable, full electronics, full safety. It's got it's it's satisfied US, Canadian, European safety requirements. Next. It's another view of the innards of this machine, which is very sophisticated, made in Geelong, as I as I said. So we're capable of making it's it's modular. So we can make large numbers of these machines. Just to give you an idea, one of these machines, one of these machines can decorticate the crop from a thousand hectares. And so that would mean if we had a million hectares of hemp, industrial hemp in Australia, which is our vision for a start, that would require a thousand such machines. But the return on investment on this machine is extraordinary. Next. Now, I just want to show you the development of this machine. So in 2012, that's what it looked like. Next. Then we go through to 2016. Then we had to add all of the, the inner workings are still the same, but all of the trappings all had to keep being developed for global markets. Next, the machine in 2018. And then you can see what it looks like, the current machine, which is the first picture I showed you. Next. So hemp fiber and herd is now significantly more cost effective to produce without retting by using this decorticator. It provides a very real substitute for existing products in local and global markets. On the left, you can see raw fiber. On the right, it's degummed fiber for textile production. Most of the time, it's only for textiles that you need to degum. 
perhaps for some certain types of rope, but the raw fibre is all of the other usages. Next. Herd, the secondary product, it looks like wood chip. It can be used to make hempcrete, paper, cellulose, plastic, cellulosic materials, fuel ethanol. That's where we get the ethanol at a very competitive price. In fact, hemp can solve Australia's risky position strategically on lack of self-sufficiency in fuel. Hemp can be the source of that ethanol without distorting other markets, building products and building walls. Next. There's a picture of a hemp herd and binder wall. It gives maximum insulation and it breathes. It's fire resistance, huge. It's wonderful for fire prone areas. Next. There's a beautiful hempcrete wall at Freshwater Creek in Victoria showing some existing artistic design possibilities. You can make buildings out of hempcrete in numbers of different ways. And this wall shows you the in situ way to grow. You can make bricks, blocks, pavers, panels and in situ formwork. Next. Hemp composites, which think of think of fiberglass, replacing fiberglass and plastics are light and strong. The ideal replacement for fiberglass and some carbon fiber. Shipping pallets and caravans and car bodies can be made from unretted raw hemp fiber. That is a lotus that was made out of hemp fibre from our machine. Next. Hemp fibre is the strongest natural fibre on the planet. There are 10 significant advantages of industrial hemp. Environmentally clean, efficiently and effectively sequesters CO2, 20 tons of, 22 tonnes of CO2 per hectare conservatively. Minimal fertilizers and zero chemicals, efficient water use, improved soil, attractive profits, natural antibacterial, antimicrobial, and anti mold. Each product has competitive advantages, can value add to hemp raw materials in multiple ways, and you can supply local and global markets. Different strokes for different folks. Next. The best value added hemp based products to focus on in the next five years for both local and global markets are fiber for textiles, fiber for biodegradable weed matting to replace black plastic as a weed matting. Geo fabrics are also a big market, herd for hempcrete and various building purposes, fiber for insulation, herd for horse bedding, poultry bedding, seed for local planting or export for planting. Next. Seed for food. So hemp foods are magnificent. So go to your supermarket and get hemp seed oil. Put hemp seed oil into your diet every day. You don't cook with it. You have it raw. It's magnificent omega-3 six, omega three and 6 source. Seed for cosmetics. The, the seed can also be used for diesel fuel. Fibre for composite materials. Fibre and herd for edible food containers. We are replace, we're helping farmers replace their plastic food containers with biodegradable hemp containers, fibre and herd to replace plastics, herd for ethanol, fibre for ropes, baling, twine and string, fibre for medicinal bandages, herd for garden mulch, the world's best mulch for suppressing weeds. And, and Fabiano talked about suppressing weeds. Hemp is a magnificent weed suppressant. Next. Successful competition against other products and successful global hemp industry growth requires five strategic initiatives. I haven't got time to go through, but just quickly go through these, please, Sam. We want to generate market demand for hemp rather than farmer push. We don't say grow lots of hemp and then we'll sell it. No, we're driving the AIHA and our company. We're focusing on getting companies that hemp can solve problems for in the ESG and circular economy and then go up the supply chain back to the farmers. Next. We embrace an abundance philosophy and not one of scarcity. That's a whole seminar on itself. Next. We avoid commoditization of hemp products. Commoditization is great for the traders, bad for farmers. We are interested in maximizing profitability for 
farmers, as the producers, as the risk takers, and for everybody along the supply chain. Now, what commoditization does, we are not interested in competing against cheap hemp cotton t-shirts. I'm wearing a hemp t-shirt. I can wear my hemp t-shirt for four weeks in a row, no wash, no smell. That's the amazing elements, the, the, the wonderful qualities of this fiber. Next. We recommend harnessing the skills, experience and relationships in local communities to identify the hemp products that should be produced and then supply the hungry markets that want these products. So each region can make different products. We don't need Australia to become a maker of only one or two or three hemp products. No need to. Next. We need to educate politicians and enlist their support. And by the way, in Australia now, it is totally is easy. The Queensland government has a pathetic attitude to hemp. I call them out on it. They say they're interested. They do things to stop people. They're influenced by the Queensland police, whose attitude to cannabis is shocking. But other than Queensland, all of Australia is supportive of hemp. Next. Australian Industrial Hemp Alliance is promoting organic, biodynamic and biological farming practices and production. We have a regenerative agriculture subcommittee of which I'm a part. Hemp is naturally antibiotic, cuts UV rays. It will enable regional industries and economies to flourish. Next. By the way, and Fabiana here representing the New South Wales government, the New South Wales government is far more enlightened than the Queensland government. So here's my closing statement. Industrial hemp without retting can make an immediate, inspiring, nurturing, positive, sustaining and life-giving difference to our planet. The more D8 decorticators that are used globally, the better our planet will become. Your job is to share the ideas, insights and possibilities that have occurred to you by experiencing this presentation to create a surge in economic activity, jobs and skills development in the biochar field, there is going to be so much biomass available from different sources that hemp is clearly going to be a wonderful feed source for biochar. That's another conversation, the economics of that. But hemp makes total sense. And Don inviting me to speak about hemp to educate people around the extraordinary possibilities is very enlightened on your part. Next slide. There's the website for TCI and for the Hemp Alliance by mobile. Thank you. That is me done. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Charles. Love it. Um, yeah, wouldn't mind one of those hemp cars, and then we could, then we could pyrolyze those when they finally cark as hemp well. Hemp t-shirt. Everybody, get a hemp t-shirt. Don't have to wash your clothes. Right. It's all going to it's all biodegradable products, isn't it? The end end of their life. Once you've made the high yeah. end product, we can then pyrolyze those all at the end of life as well, um, yeah. and 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 then reinvent them into biochar products, and they're gonna gonna la then last for thousands of years. But that yeah. um, I understand a, a hemp a hemp plant um, absorbs four times the amount of CO2 of a tree. Is that correct? Is that a correct statement correct. to make? Yep. Yeah. So, you know, we, we may uh, in this uh, net zero decade, this carbon drawdown decade, um, we may start to see a shift away from traditional forestry to some of the, uh, some of these crops such as hemp. And uh, if, yeah, and, Thank you, Charles. We we will come to you if you've got any questions for Charles. We'll we'll come to you at the end. And, and, and Monica uh, asked a question. Just is are there any trials or commercial sites of hemp in Queensland? Yes, there are quite a number. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. So look, we'll move straight on to our next speaker. Um, and so thank you, Charles. And that's Peter Brown um, from Miss Miss Kansas, New Zealand. And uh, he has more than 40 years experience from a background of forest management in New Zealand, Australia, Asia, and the Pacific. Uh, this included valuation of natural resources, including mining, as security for funding uh, for resource development projects, work with financial specialists followed, and 
they now have financing networks in uh, North America, Asia and Europe. Uh, work expanded into sustainable energy uh, generation, including importation of Miscanthus cross giganteus uh, for such green energy production, established trials through, throughout New Zealand. And uh, Peter's uh, specialities are renewable energy project development, Miscanthus, development of natural resource businesses, natural resource valuation and forest planning and management. So you were once uh, a traditional forester, but now you've moved into uh, into Miscanthus. So that's that's also interesting. I'll hand it over to you, Peter. Okay, we've got that um, we've got that uh, audio issue uh, still occurring. Um, so uh, if if uh, we can't resolve that, I'm going to give you a call on the on the phone, uh, Peter. Um, yeah, and we might have to get you talking through the uh, through the mobile. So looks like you can't. We can't hear you there. Is that correct? So I'll just um, talk to you on the on the uh... can can okay, people yeah. hear okay? Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, we can't hear you, um, and we don't. We have no idea why we can't hear you, Peter. Um, so, what what we might do um, is uh, is actually um, perhaps we'll hand over to you, Craig, if you want to say any further uh, little comments um, regarding what we've spoken about, and then. Um, we might come back to Peter if we can resolve that later. Um, Craig, did you have any any comments to make uh, on what we talked about so far? Sorry, guys. Can everyone hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yep. Sorry, can't hear you, Peter. Hopefully we can get that audio back. Um, but yeah, I think, first of all, thank you to both Charles and, um, and to Fabiano for two excellent presentations. Um, I think probably one of the, the key things that I wanted to, um, to mention with all this is in terms of the context for food production is the, the concept of a, a looming food crisis by 2050 with an increasing population and the need for Australia to play its role in terms of um, reversing land degradation, which is a, a major uh, factor in um, productivity uh, for food production. So if we can do our best to, uh, to turn around uh, marginal land and to make that more productive and not compete with food, but actually enhance it, there's a, an unfortunate um, uh, concern globally with bioenergy that it would be in competition to uh, productive food land. Certainly in the US, it's been um, criticised by a lot of uh, non-government organisations where um, productive food lands have been uh, overtaken for certain crops, for, for certain biofuels, things like that. Um, in terms of where the opportunities are here, where we're looking at marginal lands and uh, lands for rehabilitation, such as mine rehabilitation and, and, uh, and other rangelands that may not be um, as productive for, um, for cropping, that we could help to enhance uh, those areas by reversing land degradation and increasing soil carbon in an upward cycle. And I think that's where, this is where I guess I'm coming from the perspective of um, both growing it, um, which has its own um, soil sequestration that comes with it, as well as um, then potentially with the residues that are left over for pyrolysis is actually making biochar to go back into that ground and um, 
and help to, on a number of areas, uh, uh, lift the properties of those soils in, in certain areas. So I think, uh, I don't know if we can get any sort of two-way feedback or whether we'll start the Q&A, but um, I wanted to, I guess, quickly uh, uh, thank the, the two presenters because I thought uh, so far they've been great. Hopefully we can get the Miscanthus going as well because the uh, the opportunities here to for fast-growing um, uh, drawdown in a profitable way for these kind of species is all uh, something we need to be looking at. And for, I will actually also add that uh, there's opportunities for um, non-terrestrial biomass to be con uh, to be considered as well for this kind of stuff. So uh, we're looking at terrestrial ones today, but we could also be looking at aquatic um, drawdown as well, which is pretty exciting. Thanks, Craig. Um, yeah, so um, just to let you know that uh, we're live streaming on Hopin, and this is going to be the virtual platform that we're using for our fifth comp conference, which is going to be live and virtual um, from Perth. And uh, uh, so if you like what you're seeing, yeah, please get your abstracts uh, in if you're a presenter or uh, early bird registration by next uh, Thursday. Um, what I might do now is uh, if uh, we're just trying to resolve uh, Peter's uh, audio issues in the background. So what I might do is introduce Sam, Sam Sagami, who's our uh, cluster manager, and uh, just to do the, uh, just to moderate the, um, the Q&A. Um, although I've just seen that Sam's gone on to her, her mobile. Um, so uh, yeah, we just, um, We'll just wait wait a quick moment, but Sam, um, we just need you to moderate the questions as we'll go into the into the questions now. So um, we'll just give Sam Sam a little moment. Um, yeah. So Don, if you've will, got any questions, yep, go Craig. I was just going to say I'm, I can start on a couple of questions while Sam's there. I've also just okay. asked Sam. I've got a, a couple of slides that we okay. might be able to show if uh, if she wants to load them up. So I've just emailed those. Um, I might just start on a couple of the questions. First of all, I'll um, I'll start with your comment as well uh, and say, Charles, can I have a hemp lotus as well, please? <laughs> so um, well, that was fantastic. I don't think I've seen uh, a, such a, a great example of a high quality uh, carbon tech product um, from uh, from a, 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 a product like this. It's fantastic. So I think more and more options uh, in that space are going to be taken up. Um, okay, so for Fabiano, um, there was a question there on what is the increase in soil carbon from Australian native trees uh, from uh, Patrick uh, Condon there? Um, that's a good question. That's not something we have um, enough um, time to have, um, you know, a good um, feeling for that yet. Um, you know, the trials are only about two years old, you know, the, the oldest ones. So, I don't expect to see a um, you know any significant impact at least for a few years after we you know we've had the trees on the ground. So, but it, you know typically yeah if you if you do have a system where you're planting native trees where previously was degraded land, there will definitely be a positive impact there on soil carbon. But that would be very variable depending on the site condition and um, the species used as well. So there's not a simple answer there, but um, it's quite variable. And uh, watching from our experience, we don't quite have the data yet to share. Yeah. Um, question from George for uh, to Charles with hemp. Um, just looking, obviously, the other um, typical concerns that you mentioned from the Queensland Police Force. That's, uh, I guess, you're looking at, um, uh, I guess, the community asking questions. What? How can it be controlled for uh, non-industrial use if it's got such a high value elsewhere? Uh, how do we how do we help to what's the industry do to to maintain that? It's probably a question you get asked a lot, I'm sure. Well, George, um, I'd love to understand more what what he means in the sense because the question is hemp costs far more than seven and a half per ton in the mainstream streets. No, no, it doesn't. That's marijuana, not hemp. So I think that's where the confusion lies. There is no value smoking industrial hemp. And for those of you who want to get good on marijuana, I think it has to be about 15% THC content, but industrial hemp is 
less than 1%, it was 0.3%. By the way, it's an interesting reason why it was 0.3%, because the French recommended it be less than 0.3% THC, because they they considered they were the only ones who could produce seeds that could therefore lock in for themselves a guaranteed market for people buying French seeds. So mm. always look at the decision, the reasons behind the decision making. So so there is no problem. There is no uh, there's no marijuana issue. By the way, there's another issue, Craig. The word marijuana came from a Mexican village, and hands 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 the guy who used to run prohibition in america in 1930 marijuana was made illegal in america they called it marijuana because i said all the mexicans go crazy from cannabis and so that's where the word came from and it for thousands of years people have used it and it is a magnificent medicinal product and relaxational product and the and the reason why it was made illegal and all of you can go and research this was because the people working to prohibit alcohol when it was made alcohol was made legal they needed another job so the bureaucrats went bang we're going to we're going to make something else illegal and it was marijuana or it was cannabis I think that I think one of the best things that can happen there is, as you mentioned, the fact that there's such a big difference, like what 15 or 20 fold difference there in um, THC content. That message makes it pretty clear. Um, okay, um, I had a question there for Fabiano too. Well, I've, I've got one for both of you guys. Um, uh, you mentioned there about woody and non-woody woody species and the potential for co-benefits. So you mentioned that like miscanthus and hemp. Um, what do you see there? Because obviously, you know, a, a lot of the uh, rehabilitation of sites such as mine sites is looking at diversity, more looking in the natural area, in, sorry, in the native um, uh, rehabilitation areas. But in terms of diversity benefits economically um, for productive areas on site, what do you think would be the benefits there for, for having both of those growing together? I think it's horses for courses to some extent, Craig. But um, you know, if you're talking about degraded land and, and in a mining situation, then things like uh, biodiversity values become quite important. Um, and I guess there will be, all, you know, the, the biodiversity benefits from, um, you know, um, hemp or miscanthus will be lower than for native trees, obviously. Um, so it really depends on what you're trying to achieve with your, you know, tree planting or your plant growing. Um, Obviously, the uh, the biomass productivity from banner grass and hemp, it's you know, miscanthus as well. I mean, they're, they're just phenomenal. So it's 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 obviously a you know if that is your main interest in terms of uh, obtaining biomass that may be you know suitable for particular per, from, a, from an energy perspective. Um, if um, you know productivity is your only or main interest, then that's that's definitely a, an area of interest. But if you're talking about you know areas where we're trying to achieve multiple benefits and they're equal in importance then you know i guess they become those benefits become limited for those for the more grassy sort of plants yeah and craig i would make the, i would make the observation that that hemp and i didn't mention this and fabiano was talking about i meant to mention it that hemp has an amazing remedial capa re remediation capability. Hemp, the hemp plant absorbs chemicals out of the soil, and you can and and it's been shown in tobacco areas, for example, where heavy chemicals were put down, mining sites as well. It absorbs chemicals out of the soil, and after after a few, depending on the soil, of course, that then becomes viable for other purposes. So, and then I, I have a I have a connection for the then the disposal of that biomass because then you say well if it's if it's in the hemp stalk at least we've got it out of the soil then what do we do and then there is a burning process and the final piece of char there is a disposal process for the heavy, heavy metals and chemicals concentrated there so hemp as a remediator we'd love the new south wales government fabiano you know to do some trials on this so we'll have a conversation it's funny you mentioned that, Charles. I know I'm, I'm based here in Newcastle, and um, the Uni Uni of Newcastle has done work with hemp on PFAS, on um, firefighting foam contaminants uh, with Defence Force in um, treating for that. So there's uh, another application as well. So I think um, the, the key with where there's an organic uh, contaminant that's taken up by the plant, you're going to see that be um, destroyed and deconstructed by thermal treatment processes. So that's where 
if you've got that as a, a remediation mechanism, so it's basically concentrating it, taking it, and then we can take it and process it. And then in terms of metals, um, that's another angle too, with, depending on what you want to do with that. Um, we can turn that, when I say we can turn the industry, can turn that into um, either a uh, char that can go into industrial applications such as roads, um, which in terms of, and the metals are all bound up. So it becomes like an activated carbon and, and binds those metals to it. Depending on the concentration of those metals, they may not actually be uh, limiting to um, uh, to a, uh, a non-industrial application. But if, if, if the truth is, though, if you're, if you're going to a targeted contaminated site with heavy metal contamination to clean it up with a hemp, it's very likely you would end up with a concentrated char that, has, that is only for industrial applications. And, and potentially, uh, the EPAs do get concerned that, that uh, if it's too much there, that it may actually not be suitable for certain applications because they don't want to see uh, wastes going into, into the landscapes. Uh, they've already had this problem with mixed waste organics going onto mine sites for rehab and other places as well that already had contamination in it. So they're very careful about um, recy recycling waste products into other applications in, in broad scale, particularly in broad scale. But um, there's a bit of work to be done there, but I, I second your call to uh, to establish trials. So I think we're, we're commercial trials will, will come, uh, hopefully not too far away. So, uh, have we got any more questions there? I think I, I'll lead to one here from John. John John Hicks has just mentioned RE hemp sequestration. I, I noticed, John, uh, Charles, that you mentioned about 22 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per hectare. Um, just wanted to know if you knew some background to that and whether it might actually be a lot higher. Uh, I would have expected to see that quite considerably higher. Yeah, no, I have I have data, and we're, and we're being we're being funded by a small amount of money from Agri Futures for an RDE project. One of those is is to identify what the best research process is to identify that precisely. So the whole but carbon. Sequestration is a big issue. I've had numbers that suggest 100 tonnes of CO2 per hectare in terms of the sequestration impact. Um, I, that, is, that is an ongoing matter. There is good data supporting the 22 tonnes, and that's not a bad start. So, yeah, and that's, that's the direct sequestration into the plant itself, is that right? Correct. Yep. And, then, okay. and then all the, the usage of those plants doesn't release that CO2. No, and that's where I think the the, the buyer, you know, the the industry, the industry is looking at these kind of um, products as a permanence issue. So we deal with the we get the carbon capture, but then the permanence, which is the other key issue for carbon credits, and for um, yeah, for the genuine purpose, which is climate change, is to keep it out of the atmosphere, is yeah. uh, is to put into these applications. So most biochars in both um, agricultural uses in soils are, are long term stable. And certainly in uh, industrial applications and carbon tech, you know, you put we turn that carbon into uh, a fiber that can end up into things like uh, you know, thermal batteries and, and, and cars and, and carbon fiber replacements and resin replacements uh, like they're doing in Europe. There's out an Audi dealership in Germany, in Munich, that's made out of biochar um, panels all over the hexagon panels over the front of it. So a bit like what you're doing with hemp uh, as a, a fiber uh, a source originally. Even with the residues that we get at end of life, we can still bring those back into productive products like that too as well, which is, I think, a complementary process, which is a, another benefit you can add to hemp as well. And, and, and remember that the, 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 the 10 tonne dry weight biomass on average can be up to 20 tonnes per hectare, produces seven tonnes of herd. And if that herd is used for hempcrete, that will be permanently locked away so mm -hmm. that's that's a relevant factor so the fiber is just one element of that um yep. john john hicks is asking some excellent questions john i'd love you to think of every difficult question that you can because we're going to put all that into our r and d exercises of what needs to be what percentage of the carbon is retained in the roots and root exudates well four tons on average of root matter per per hectare so above ground, below ground, and then the precise percentages I've got. We've got a detailed paper that goes through this off the top of my head. I don't want to bore people with the details, but happy to share that paper. And then to get John's impact input on what else you'd like to know with pleasure. And the rainfall, um, essentially in Australia, we recommend irrigation 
availability for anything north of the Murray River. So in Western Australia, they haven't got irrigation. So wheat is grown because hemp grows. Hemp grows this biomass, 20 tonnes per hectare in 100 days. It clearly needs water. So if the, if the soil is good, then it, rainfall is not so relevant as a rainfall area of some, let me get this right, 30 inches these days is 900 millimetres, roughly. So the wheat belt, there's lots of hemp being grown in WA, and so wheat belt soils seem to be okay for growing it without much irrigation. I think you've you've probably just started to answer a, a good question here from Annette as well, who was asking about um, how broadly and for how long has hemp production been demonstrated in Australia? That was the first part. The second part I think you might have answered. Can the high yields you mentioned be maintained for subsequent crops without fertilizer and irrigation in the infertile infertile soils and low rainfall environments across most of Australia? So um, you know you mentioned the Murray there and north of that, but in terms of other areas, how how viable for high yields there as well? Oh, when I just lost Charles there. We'll come back to you, Fabiana. There's a question there for you then while him comes, uh, uh, Charles comes back online. Um, Thomas has just asked, um, forest, for forest establishment, is native management, uh, native forest management uh, for biomass, for biochar feasible? I would have thought that was the purpose. <laughs> yeah, no, that was what we're trying to, to show with this because, um, you know, we're talking about um, hardy, uh, low management species, which, um, you know, would only be there for two or three years before they are harvested. So we're talking about, you know, the risk element with a lot of native forestry is to do with uh, longer rotations and, you know, the potential for bushfires and things like that as well, which um, obviously would be negated by the very short rotations that we'll be, you know, working with here. So I think, yeah, no, it's it's quite a, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll think this is quite a, um, a potential, you know, potentially through a proposition for biochar for sure. And Thomas's second question there, which is a good one, um, and I know with Miscanthus, um, there's a lot of species that are actually only being allowed to be grown in Australia uh, that aren't going to propagate as a weed. Um, so that's uh, there's a question there, uh, but there's one here for hemp. Um, so for Charles, if you're there, what are the best practice management actions to stop hemp from becoming another pest plant here in Australia? Well, and it also asked an excellent question. Hemp was first grown in the mid-90s in Australia, in Tasmania. We, it was our company that started growing it with the approval of Jeff Kennett for a trial crop in 1997. And so the, the, so it's a, well over 20 years, there's been plenty of crops, successful crops grown. It's an easy crop to grow if you, don't, if you know what you're doing, but like most things, if you don't know what you're doing, it's difficult. The question of rotation, so hemp, is going to be a magnificent rotation crop for the sugarcane industry that has to rotate 20% of its land. Um, the question of can you plant the hemp in the same soil time after time, it's not recommended, but each soil will be different because around the world there are examples of 10, 12 consecutive successful crops. So the other question of that, that result is also going to depend on the quality of soil. We have people growing hemp where the on the one farm where the crop the, because the soil is different gets different results in different parts of the same farm so they're all the standard farming elements for thomas um, hemp can never become a pest plant in the sense that in europe it's growing along irrigation channels in america it's growing along irrigation channels from the original hemp grown in kentucky that was the home of hemp and when people realise how good hemp is, it will always be harvested and sold. So I, I, it would be magnificent to have it as a pest plant. It causes no, I, I'm not aware of any harm that it causes to the environment. And if it grows naturally, we harvest it and use it for biochar, Don. Thank you. Yeah, of course, Charles. Um, look, if it's okay, we might just uh, uh, try Peter again and uh, we, we will go over it a little bit over time, but we can come back uh, possibly to the final lot of questions at the end again. So, Peter, if you would like to um, add yourself to the stream and uh, see if your, uh, your sound is now working. So if you could please say something, Peter. Nope. Okay. Still no, still no go. Can you talk? 
Say something, Peter. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. No? Okay. All it right. seems that we can hear him if he makes a noise, but he, he can't hear you, yeah. John. Can you actually speak, Peter? I'm assuming that you can see the presentation, okay? We can hear you. Um, we can hear you. I've got some problems <laughs> with not being able to hear anything that's being said to me now. But um, uh, we can hear you. This so that's, presentation uh, yeah. is on behalf of Miscanthus New Zealand Limited. Right. Uh, we'll I tailored the that. presentation to aiming towards the biochar side of things because this is a biochar um, group. But um, I need to go into some detail about Miscanthus uh, in the interim to uh, give us some background on what I'm doing and what it's all about. Um, what is Miscanthus? It's a, it's a perennial C4 grass related to sugar cane. It's a um, triploid hybrid, so it's completely sterile. It's of temperate origin, it comes from Japan, so it, it doesn't mind pretty cold winters, but it likes warmth. It's cellulosic with very high productivity, it's tolerant of low fertility sites. It has very low, is a very low input crop once it's established, and it just keeps on going for at least 25 years. Uh, it's a multi-use crop, which is pretty important as far as I'm concerned, and most uh, growers as well. That's what it looks like at the end of the second growing season on that particular site. Oh no, the third growing season. It had been harvested the previous winter slightly more than or slightly less. Than Hi, Peter. Than I'm more sorry. Could you just hold on one moment, um, and I'll just grab your presentation up because we can't see it right in general, now. In general, include boiler fuel, as is internationally, uh, stock shelter on irrigated dairy you farms in New Zealand, <laughs> stock bedding for horses, sheep, cows, goats, um, wood pellets, and that ranges from the ordinary wood pellets that you. Uh, see for sale in places like Bunnings for domestic use, right through to fire logs. Um, greatly reduces nitrogen leaching from sites, almost eliminating it. Um, it's uh, used for the production of electricity and superchar, and the production of renewable diesel fuel, which we are, I'm calling RDF just to simplify things. And it also makes what I, or the Lincoln University research has shown to be the best commercial mulch you can get. Um, there's a picture of chipped miscanthus, um, which is pretty much how it is as harvested. Um, you, you can see it's uh, got material up the middle. It's not hollow, so it's, and that's one of the reasons it has high production. Uses for fuel, it's for boiler fuel which is a big use internationally, and chipped directly like the previous picture as wood pellets or as whole bales. Um, it's, it goes right up to the fuel logs, as I just said. We can use for electricity production, direct burning of pellets or um, burning of syngas, which I'll mention a little bit later on. And, and these have been used for years overseas. It's a picture of wood pellets made from miscanthus. Um, from um, in Miscanthus made in New Zealand, actually grown in New Zealand. It's used for renewable diesel, which is a big and completely certain use, uh, is for production of low sulfur U U renewable diesel. And when I say diesel, I'm not talking about biodiesel, I'm talking about diesel. It's a direct substitute, a drop-in substitute for diesel. And it, it makes it way superior to biofuel things which have to have their own separate set of specs because they're so different from um, uh, fossil diesel. Um, RDF's been produced from cellulosic biomass in the USA for a few years now. It's, it's been used to making, uh, um, the process has been used for making electricity prior to that for quite a few years and that's still going. Commercial scale plants also operating already um, making about 27 million litres of diesel per year, which is about 50% more than what we regard as a standard um, size plant. And the markets for that product have been mostly road and rail transport, um, but it's fixed machinery and low sulfur marine fuels are also markets. It has to be borne in mind that it hasn't, 
it can be used without any infringement of manufacturer's warranties at all because it is diesel and it meets all the specifications to diesel. This is a picture of what it looks like. Um, it's getting to be a bit of an old picture and the more recent stuff is, is uh, even clearer still than that. Um, just growing and harvesting in Miscanthus is better than carbon neutral. And that's been assessed by uh, Bioenergy Cropping Solutions who produced a detailed report on not only the carbon side of things, but the energy side of things as well. And production of RDF with Superchar as a co-product is better than carbon neutral. Um, and you, any of you to do with biochar will know that that tends to apply because uh, the biochar itself, in this case the superchar, is uh, permanently sequestered uh, carbon. And in, in addition, the, using it to the RDF to replace fossil diesel is itself obviously better than carbon neutral. Here's a picture of Miscanthus at a site at uh, Helensville uh, near Auckland at the end of its fourth growing season that had been harvested for the, each of the previous three. That's probably got about 50% more growth to occur before it's harvested. Um, so how is this relevant to biochar? In the course of making RDF, superchar is produced. It's called superchar to distinguish it from ordinary biochar because it is dramatically different. It has multiple uses and it has a very high graphene content. So if you don't know about graphene, look it up. It's, it's uh, an amazing new discovery, which a few years ago, a couple of guys got a Nobel Prize for finding out about. Like other biochars, it can be used to enhance plant growth. And here's a picture of the um, control in the middle and um, two different levels of biochar application. This is in, in Tennessee, and it's uh, a mixture of um, red oak and cottonwood poplar. But you can see that it can, can the biochar can cause dramatic increases in, in growth. Uh, this, uh, these figures here show the same sort of thing, but um, I, if you're having trouble seeing it, I suppose the writing is in black and it's too small, really. But that's just straight from the states. And it showed that if you put in the, the top application they talked about, you, know, you got a 440% increase in, in production. If you put in the, the smaller quantity, you got a 300% increase. And so it is quite dramatic. And you can see it really clearly in their picture there. It's um, used in broiler chicken farms, reduces odor, cuts down mortality, improves weight gain and foot health and all that sort of thing. Um, it makes great fertilizer um, as when it's, it's composted after its use in the chicken chicken house. And the compost retail sale price is in the order of 2,500 US dollars a ton. That's the US ton. Um, and there's an example with hops where the yield increased by over 400% by the addition of biochar, which is pretty significant. And this, the last one of those sort of things is water stressed soybeans being deliberately water stressed as they're being grown had a 70% um, to 95% reduction in the um, water usage, which in many areas is pretty important. And I should think it is exposed to some areas in Australia. So how does that benefit farmers? Just by growing Miscanthus, it can stabilize farm net revenue because its production is pretty consistent and you can know well in advance exactly what you're going to get that from that hectare of land, not only this year, but next year and the year after. Um, older farmers don't have to retire so early because the more of their farm they put into Miscanthus, the less work they have to do once it's established. And um, miscanthus, growing miscanthus can reduce the reliance on forest industry for biochar feedstock because in many places, and in New Zealand in particular, I which I guess I'm emphasizing, if there's a downturn in the forest industry and there's less forest harvested, there's a downturn in the production of the arisings uh, such as forest industry processing residues. And so to some extent, any industry that uses those residues is um, dependent on 
um, the forest industry carrying on working well. But it, I've mentioned before, it dramatically reduces nitrogen leaching and um, measurements with lysimeters done below Miscantha stands in New Zealand have shown that with 140 kilograms of nitrogen being applied each per hectare each year, uh, the leaching below the Miscantha stand was less than 0.5 of a kilogram of nitrogen per hectare. And that, to put it in perspective, um, pine forest with just rainfall going on it leaches two or three kilograms. And so it is dramatically better. And super chaff from Miscanthus, uh, obviously, because it's carbon neutral, better than carbon neutral, better than carbon neutral, and better than carbon neutral in the Miscanthus growing, the processing, uh, uh, um, and then the substitution for fossil diesel um, is obviously. It's, it's it's very very good thing to be doing from a greenhouse gas point of view. Um, so how does it benefit farmers? Every business in New Zealand relies on diesel directly or indirectly. And um, one of the benefits of renewable diesel is once you've got the plant set up, you can have a, pay people a fixed price for the feedstock index to inflation, and um, the renewable diesel can be sold at a fixed price uh, for plus New Zealand inflation um, for basically as far ahead as you um, are able to tie down the supply contract. Uh, Superchar will be a valuable new export industry with many industrial uses because it's needed internationally in large quantities. And one of the examples being that it makes addition of it to bitumen when it's being made it makes it last longer and it makes it more water resistant and it's obviously very attractive to people building roads and it makes contract concrete not only stronger but it makes it cure much faster which i'm told by engineers is a big selling point you're building a building and you do a concrete pour you don't have to wait two weeks for it to cure you only have to wait two or three days and graphene which is in the superchar and big quantities or big percentages, and it's got an increasing number of high value uses. And the price that we've been offered for it exceeds 3,000 US dollars per tonne of dry matter. Um, so, what needs to happen? What needs to happen is investment into growing more miscanthus crops to try to meet rapidly increasing demand from a whole variety of uses, including superchar production. Investment in superchar production plants, and I'll put it that way around, because the superchar is so valuable, it simply carries everything else, and diesel can be sold at whatever price you want to choose to sell it at, as, as low as possible. It can't be um, beaten by competition from big oil companies. They simply they can't sell diesel as cheaply as a superchar production plant can afford to do so. Um, Another thing is investment into Miscanthus New Zealand itself, which is basically pushing all this stuff to enable faster expansion of the superchar industry in Australia and New Zealand. In other words, investment in big letters, of course. That's where you guys come in. You need to buy into or even buy Miscanthus New Zealand Limited, because um, I'm not getting any, getting any younger. You need to pull funds to establish the first superchar slash uh, renewable diesel plant. And you, you need to convince all the investors, including government, to fund that sort of development because that really is the future. So that sums the whole thing up. So there's my contact details. I'll leave them there for you to have a have a look, think about, and uh, I'll take it from there. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Peter. Um, we're uh, going to uh, just sort your um, your. Uh, audio issues there we'll give you a call and come back to your questions so if uh if craig or uh or sam um was there craig if you wanted to just finish off those few questions to the other guys um and we're going to call peter and uh get him to read the questions off the screen and then answer them uh because at the moment he can't, he can't hear us thank you no worries. Thanks, Don. Um, so, yeah, if uh, maybe Charles and Fabiana could come back on online. Uh, a couple of questions there for you first, Charles. Um, Eric's question there about 
uh, potential for non-monoculture hemp applications? Is there? Um, look, I'm I'm all in favour of non-monoculture, and I would have thought that you know my, my in terms of the conversation I said before in terms of rotation of crops. If you had if you had a 100 hectare farm, you know it seems to me you would do 30 hectares of of hemp, move it to the next 30 hectares, the next 30 hectares. And I don't, I'm, I'm opposed to monoculture. So that, that would be my picture of the, of how that would be done. Because if you go too micro, then it's too hard to make, too hard to make a profit from it. So that's how I would approach that question of the rotation. Yeah. So like, more like a mosaic approach. Yes. Um, and the other, the other question is the it's not possible to grow effectively. You can't grow rows of hemp and then grow crops between the rows because in 120 days the rows are gone. Bang! You you can plant something else. And the roots the roots don't have to be dug out. They break down so quickly that you can plant straight over into the existing soil. Very exciting. Yeah. Um, Patrick has a question here too on, uh, has there been any research done on watering hemp with, uh, wastewaters from municipal wastewater? I have a recollection that there has, would not be recommended because of hemp's wonderful ability to absorb impurities from its environment. So I'm, I'm, I will dig out that research, but, um, early in my career in hemp, I was told, no, no, don't use, don't use wastewater. Uh, there is another big, there's another big issue, Craig, that that I, I really want to um, bring to the attention of everybody, and it's the chicken egg situation. So, the chicken egg is that that farmers aren't growing industrial hemp crops large enough to supply the markets because they don't know where they're going to sell the crops. The markets who need hemp fiber and herd and seed are not interested in hemp. They're not going to gear up to use hemp because the farmers aren't growing it. The farmers aren't growing it because the markets aren't interested. That's why strategically we are focusing on the end markets to drive market demand and our strategy is to sign contracts with well cashed up end buyers to then feed that up the supply chain of farmers. I said that, but that chicken egg issue is a real issue. But there's pressure on big companies, and Peter, your presentation was excellent. I enjoyed that around Miscanthus. New Zealand and Australia have both got strategic risk around fuel source, but the big companies have ESG pressure on them and circular economy pressure, and we have to position ourselves so that they drive market demand goes up and production always below that so that the return to farmers is excellent. Yeah. That's a really good point, Charles. I mean, certainly it's the same in, in our industry and all recycled product industries where um, basically if people aren't buying the recycled product, there is no point in recycling it or producing it. Smart. It's got to be market uh, a market-led approach. And I totally agree with you. Um, we're seeing it inside the biochar sector where um, one of the companies, um, Rainbow Beta, has been selling biochar credits and from the net zero commitment, so if you're looking at Paris Agreement and net zero 2050 commitments in most countries uh, and certainly all states in Australia, even in the absence of a federal target, we're seeing uh, things like in Europe with the Green Deal where the push towards net zero is driving um, a pull, oh, sorry, demand pulling uh, credits through. And certainly we see the same with circular economy. Um, the Europeans were just talking about that uh, recently about the um, the drive with that and the ESG commitments. I uh, sat in a meeting with the managing director of a, um, a large uh, rare earths company for making um, um, uh, metals to go into renewables, uh, who said that their um, supporters in, in, in Asia, for their financiers, the first thing they ask is ESG questions. They said they want to know about where it's going. So there's a big, big push on this. So I totally agree that that angle is a good way to do a differentiator for both your industry and, and ours as well. Peter, can you hear us all right now? I just noticed you're there. Oh, I think I think I could just hear you then. I bet I think you can hear me. Just thumbs up if you can hear us, mate. Yep, okay. We can't quite hear you though, so I'm not sure what the uh, angle will be to try and get you. Maybe if you're going through Don's phone, 
you could um, I don't know if we yeah. can do, get yeah. you back on with turning your turning your mic on like you were before. Yeah. So maybe you can listen to us through Don and speak through your mic. Yeah, we had his uh, we had the audio finished um, and then uh, okay, so I'm calling you, but I not sure where the questions are so um yeah, yeah so i'll, I'll uh, give him a call we're all gonna be on yeah, okay. everybody's on we're all gonna be right? on okay I'm... i've actually got peter on the phone right now okay um so we'll try and make this work sam do you want me to step aside do you want to read those questions in the in the margin or do you want me to do it whichever way you want yeah, if you can read the questions and then I will um, just get Peter on here. We'll see if that one works. I wonder how many meetings like this are happening around the world while everyone's in lockdown at the moment where they're going through this kind of stuff. I'm so sure it's not unique. All right, Peter, here we go. So um, I'll start at the end, actually work backwards. Anita's asked, can Mysterious Gigantius be grown in all climates? And are there any rules around the crop or can anyone grow this uh, not, not going to work. Too much feedback. <laughs> Too much feedback, I think. So he need, uh, Peter, you just need your headphones back on. Yes. Okay. Try, try again. Oh. Okay, Peter, the, the question from an, Anita was, can Miscanthus giganteus be grown in all climates? And are there any rules around crops or can anyone grow Miscanthus? It's, it's, it's sounding, sounding like I can, I can hear you relatively. Um, so, Peter, can Miscanthus be grown in all climates? Are there any rules yeah. around the crop or can anyone grow it? Yeah. The limitation really is um, rainfall. I was told by re European researchers right at the beginning you need a decent rainfall, which they defined as at least 600 millimetres a year. And uh, in New Zealand it's hard to find areas that are as low as that. I'm sure in Australia there's plenty of them, but that, that's the limitation. That's probably where it's going to be a good complementary crop to other areas here where we can have some of these other ones like Fabiano's looking at for, for low rainfall and the high rainfall, um, like sugarcane. I mean, Miscanthus is related to sugarcane, I understand, uh, family, so uh, similar kind of rainfall patterns. Um, there's a good question here from Annette too. Um, sorry I missed some of your talk, Peter, at the start. Um, is it called superchar because it's made from Miscanthus or because of a particular way of making the biochar from Miscanthus? Um, I think a few of us missed, missed that at the start. If you could just go back to that for us. Yeah, the, it's, no, it's, it's not unique to miscanthus. You can make super sour out of, not miscanthus, obviously purpose grown. Um, you can make it from forest industry processing residues or even from cereal straw. And the first plant that's well down the track in terms of its panning and, and lay out on a particular site is going to be based on cereal straw. And, and so it's through the processing of it, this the technology to process it, because I'm, I'm certainly very interested in the, the, the fact that it's producing graphene. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do um, to get multi-layer graphene from from uh, any feedstock um, through pyrolysis. So not impossible, but i um, interested to hear more about that. That's fantastic. Just reword that a little bit. But how do you sound what you're saying? Peter, just asking about um, the superchar as a process then. Is it, it's obviously the process that turned that you're calling it a superchar that and I was asking about if there's a link to that to yeah. graphene, because that's um, a more difficult thing to get a multi-layer graphene from um, from the biochar. Uh, the, the superchar that's produced from the process, um, it has, uh, I think I'm showing the percentage, but something like 75 percent of it is graphene, and there's been detailed analysis done by the University of Tennessee about how much of it is single layer, how much of it is double layer, and and so on. 
and uh, so so it's the process which produces it and the in, intention of the process certainly when we started getting involved with it was production of renewable diesel and the char was basically a co-product which had various uses the change now is that um the basically graphene and it's been identified and so a lot of other characteristics have been identified and it stands out now as being quite different from ordinary higher shower because of the mm-hmm. process that's that made. And is that a high temperature uh, process then to get 75% crystalline graphene? Yes, it is. Okay, thanks. Um, if, feel free to say as much as you like about the process. People would love to hear it, but I'm sure you probably don't want to say too much. But if you if you can tell anyone, um, and this is all new to the industry, so the industry would be very interested in knowing more. It sounds fantastic that someone's got so far with that. Yeah, yeah that's pretty fantastic. Um, the, uh, I've, I'd say, I think that the technology owners that, that um, their intellectual property was protected by my ignorance. Because I have a basic way of looking at things that you put feet stock in at this end and it goes through a machine and somewhere along the line and uh, the supercharger comes out and somewhere further along the line the renewable diesel comes out and uh, what's left over really is uh, um, wood vinegar, which is pyroligneous acid, which has a whole lot of uses itself one of which is plant growth enhancement also. So uh, all I know is that it's very high temperature, something like 12 or 1300 degrees Celsius that it gets heated to in the absence of oxygen. Yeah, that's that's definitely unique. That's sort of up in the gasification range, uh, well, and, well and truly, uh, very high. Uh, it's incineration range actually, but that's, that's really excellent. If you can get a a low oxygen environment at that, that temperature to produce this, that's um, world changing. So fantastic, congratulations, Peter. Um, oh, okay, some yeah. more. Some, oh, some, it's not, not some, something some I more. did. I, I just put my notice to my colleagues in the States. In the States, yep, yeah, sure. Okay, there's some more questions here. Um, I'll go to... Patrick's one here at the end. Peter, can you explain how it, how you can put 25% plastic waste into natural renewable diesel manufacturing and not degrade the product? Um, no, I can't explain that. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it's, I, I can't, I couldn't, couldn't have even have told you whether it was 20 or 25%, but I've, I've been told that they have tested it with up, up to that figure of all different sorts of plastic apart from PVC and uh, that it works absolutely fine and the proportions of these that were produced compared with the char may well differ a little bit but not, not to any significant extent. Um, can I, I might ask a question too. I noticed you had a fantastic slide in there. You mentioned it would be beneficial for Australia with soybeans where you had a huge reduction in water usage um, in pot trials by the looks. Peter, has there been any um, broader trials than, than labs so far? Has it gone into field trials or are we just that on pot trials? I would have to check with the, uh, the guys who are doing it in, in Tennessee. And uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't know, but I would be very surprised if they hadn't done field trials as well. I think that that's of, of real interest. If if we can be um, looking at crops that uh, where we're getting and using chars where we're getting reductions in water usage like that, there's there's all these positive angles for um, regenerating mar- marginal lands, uh, which have been you know for for centuries at least uh, degrading in um, their carbon content and their water content, their nutrient content, particularly here in Australia. Mm-hmm. We've also got a naturally degraded soils, of course, from our, our older areas of soil degradation. But um, in terms of being able to turn this around where we can have um, low water using um, crops that can be rotating upwards um, to re- rehabilitate marginal lands, that's a, a pretty big thing. There's a couple of studies just coming out. The, U- the United States zero uh, net zero strategy that was put together um, recently has sort of identified that 
marginal lands um, globally are about 1,300 million hectares and that there's a large amount of that available. They, they, one of their quotes was, one of the more promising options and potential productive options would be to grow energy crops on land considered largely productive for cropping without affecting production of other commodities. So that angle I was mentioning before about um, all of these types of terrestrial biomass uh, options being seen as a, a threat to food security uh, rather than a complementary or even a regenerative um, process towards food security is something. So if we can be going in with a story where we're um, helping the soils, not using up large amounts of water either, and um, getting drawdown on the way and, and regenerating our soils, it's certainly a big thing in Australia. Um, New Zealand's blessed with beautiful climates and great soils, but you are challenged with water quality uh, problems over there. I've seen some a lot of stuff from New Zealand on runoff, and that's where there's also a benefit with all of this as well. So there's a, a nice circular uh, story to, to come from all of this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, any final comments? Thanks, Craig. Um, we might have to wrap it up there, but is, does anyone have any final comments before we go? Yes. Can I make one, Don? That yep. I think is a number that should be held in everybody's mind that in Australia and America, at least 30% of all fresh food purchased in supermarkets in this country goes into landfill. And so this whole question of circular economy, we need to understand that it's better to pay 30% more for food, for, for quality food, than this nonsense of getting the cheapest possible food on a monoculture basis fully chemicalized just to save some money that then gets thrown in the tip that is sheer madness and i hope you know Anne's big and the hemp industry we're all working towards getting rid of such nonsensical behaviors here here yes thank you all right well look um thank you so much to all our presenters today so fabiano shimenez from new south wales dpi thank you uh, Charles Coves from the Australia, Australian Industrial Hemp Alliance and also get the t-shirt and uh, we're going to have to get a biochar t-shirt made of hemp, I think. Um, and uh, also Peter Brown from Miss Canthus, New Zealand. Thanks for bearing with us with the technical issues today. Um, it is our first event that we have run on uh, Hop-In, so well done to Sam um who uh yeah will probably now go and have a heart attack or something in the background <laughs> but um I, I think it we we got there in the end thank you to craig uh for moderating the questions there and uh we would hope that all of you are able to submit your abstracts uh for our fifth conference by next thursday um that would be great we'd love to have you again um whether you're going to be live in perth or virtual uh, it would be great to have you. It's your choice. Um, at this stage, we are going ahead as as normal uh, for early October. So um, thank you again. And Sam, perhaps if you could just bring up our banner uh, as you were going to do for uh, for the conference, uh, and uh, we'll we'll say goodbye. Um, but yeah, look, we we would love to have some uh, biochar trials going uh, perhaps i missed it but some biochar trials going uh on improving productivity with you fabiano and charles and of course i'm sure you've already done it uh peter but uh, if we can increase productivity by growing these biomass crops in biochar amended soil and then uh and then of course turning all the residues uh in into biochar that can't be used for high-end end users so yeah thank you again and uh we'll, we'll sign off for now thank you charles, charles. thank you very much